All right, class, welcome back. Today we are going to get into chapter 16 of your text. And chapter 16 is talking about the Gilded Age. And the way that I'm teaching it is we're going to divide it into two parts um, thematically. We're going to begin with the transformation of the West and westward expansion. I'm going to, and that's this lecture, I'm going to be talking about a movement of people into the west of the western part of the United States. I'm also going to be talking about Native Americans and the impact that that had on the Native American population. Part two of this lecture, which will be next week, uh, will be focusing on the politics and business practices and those types of things of the Gilded Age. So that will come in part two next week. All right, so let's begin by looking at the key terms. So as you can see, we're going to be talking about uh, this idea of manifest destiny, the Homestead Act, um, some of the economic um, uh, motivations for moving westward, like mining opportunities and ranching opportunities. And then we're going to turn to talking about uh, Native Americans because you know, when we think about westward expansion, we have to realize that there are all of these people that are living in these western uh, territories, native people. We also have people that are left over from the Spanish and uh, Mexican um, periods. Um, so we've got California populations, Tejano populations. So there are a lot of people out there that this westward expansion and the settlement of the western part of the United States is going to impact. So I like to begin my lectures with a map um, because maps kind of help us get oriented and looking at this map of the United States, you can see that this is a map of the United States in 1840, 1840. So this is before the beginning of our class, this is before the American Civil War. This is 1840, and you'll notice that the United States, the map of the United States is very different than what it is today. Um, the areas that you see there in red, those are actual states that have been integrated into the United States. The areas that you see there in light blue are official territories in the United States. So territories are like they're on their way to becoming states. Um, they will eventually become states. Some of the territories will divide into different to, um, states within the territories. So, if, for example, if you look at the Iowa Territory there, that eventually will become several states. So, um, but the territories are um, actually have a territorial government. They are sort of like, think of them as like baby states. They're on their way to becoming, you know, full-fledged states. Um, and then you'll notice there um, in the dark green, that is the unorganized territory. So think of that as just being the Wild West. There's no governing structure in that territory. A lot of Native people in that territory, obviously, living in those, in those areas. The other thing to notice is that entire area of orange that you see on this map is uh, Mexico, part of Mexico in 1840. Um, and this is before the Mexican-American War. The Mexican-American War ended in 1848, and the United States will gain all of that territory as a result of that war. So this is 1840. Um, then we've got Oregon country up there. Those are basically areas that um, were claimed by the United States, but um, it was technically owned by Britain. So Britain, we're going to have a treaty with Britain in 1846 where this territory will officially get passed over to the United States. So very different look to the map, right? Now, if we fast forward, right, to 1870, and, you know, this is just, you know, 30 years later, you can see that the map has changed significantly. Now you've got the states of Oregon, California, Nevada over in the west. Um, you'll notice that the areas in the middle that are light blue are territories, but they're looking very similar to what the states, the shape of the states are today. So um, basically in just 30 years time, you see this massive transformation of the map of the United States. 
So when we talk about westward expansion, we begin typically by talking about sort of this underlying philosophical assumption that goes along with westward expansion, and that's the idea of manifest destiny. This idea was actually coined by a journalist in the early 1800s, a man by the name of John O'Sullivan. And the idea of manifest destiny is very um, specific. It's basically that the Americans have sort of this God-given right or this destiny to spread the values of white civilization and expand from ocean to ocean. This is almost like as if there is sort of this divine calling um, for America to expand to the Pacific Ocean. And this sort of mandate from God is a really important thing to understand when we talk about westward expansion, because when the Americans come west, and it doesn't matter if they're coming, you know, through the Dakota territories, which were very heavily populated with native people, or if they're coming to California, which also had a lot of Native Americans and Mexicans um, for the gold rush. In all of those cases, they, Americans tend to, for the most part, carry this sense of superiority. And this is really important to understand because this will sort of motivate a lot of this behavior that we're going to see um, towards people uh, that were, you know, that were living in these territories. So when we look at this painting, and this is a painting titled Progress, um, and it is from the 19th century, so it's from the 1800s, and it tells you a lot about the mentality that um, the settlers were bringing with them. You see in the middle of this painting this angel-like figure, and she's carrying in her hand, she's carrying the telegraph wire, right, with her, which was like, you know, technology um, back then. That was like, you know, cutting edge technology, communication. In her arm, she's carrying a book. And we're not sure what that book is, but it might be a book of laws. It might be the Bible. Who knows? Um, but she's carrying some kind of book, which is like indicative of knowledge of some sort. And then if you look over in the background, you can see the trains, you can see the stagecoach, you can see these settlers moving along. Um, you see boats in the background and cities. Uh, and then on the left-hand side, right, you see all of this wildlife and you see the Native Americans and they're running and fleeing away. And, and you'll also notice that on the right-hand side of the painting, it's nice and light and kind of, you know, sunny and, and beautiful. And then you look over to the left and it's dark and cloudy and stormy, sort of indicating, you know, wildness and recklessness and uncivilization uncivilizedness is that a word um but anyway so uh you can so this painting in many ways kind of is a perfect visual representation of this idea of manifest destiny So one of the things that is bringing a lot of people out West um, in the latter half of the uh, 19th century is the Homestead Act. And the Homestead Act is actually passed in 1863 in the middle of the Civil War by the Lincoln administration. And this was sort of looking ahead for the Lincoln administration, right? Um, knowing that they were eventually going to build a transcontinental railroad um, and that it would be very important to motivate people to move out into these Western territories. So in order to do that, um, the government passed the Homestead Act. Now, the Homestead Act applies to men and unmarried women 21 years and older. You did not have to be a citizen to be eligible for the, homes, for the Homestead Act land grants. So that was also really important as well because, you know, America is a nation of immigrants and so we're constantly being replenished by immigrant populations looking for economic opportunity. So what the Homestead Act said is if you are a man or an unmarried woman above the age of 21, you would be able to be eligible for 160 acres of surveyed land. 
west of the Mississippi River. So you had to go west of the Mississippi River to get this land. Now, once you were given this land, you couldn't just claim it and not do anything with it. You had to live on it for five years and make improvements to the land. So improvements could be anything from, you know, drilling a well or building a structure. Maybe you're farming the land. Maybe you're ranching on that land. But whatever you're doing, you're doing something with the land. You can't just let it be land. Um, so live on it for five years and make improvements. And then you would apply for a title to that land. And that land would be yours if you could live on it in improvement improve it for five years. So this was, um, like I said, really important uh, motivator for a lot of people who wanted to move out west and they were looking for opportunities. And so people were doing this. Now, there were other ways that people were distributing land out west. There were land rushes where they would open up you know, at a certain time, they would open up a big chunk of land and people would rush out and stake their claim to the land. So there was different ways that this was done. Um, but basically, this was a motivator for a lot of people to move west. So African Americans were also taking advantage of these Homestead Act claims. If, for example, after the Civil War, um, a lot of freed people, if they could, um, decided to move west. Um, and so here we have a picture of an African-American homesteading family. Women also, um, as I mentioned, were eligible. Now, you had to be unmarried. And the reason for that was because if you were married in the United States uh, at this time, um, all land that uh, you would have um, had as a woman uh, was actually your husband's. So women could not be on land titles if they were married. It was the husband's name that was on the land title. So some women did go out and homestead on their own. About 15% of the homesteading land claims were made by women. And here you have a really good example of a typical homestead house out on the prairies on the plains of the United States. Um, this is a sod house, and it's made from a brick that is essentially just made from the earth. It's a combination of grass and mud, um, you know, squished together, compressed together. And it was a really efficient way of building a home back then. Um, in these areas, it gets very cold in the winter and very hot in the summer. And so it was a really good insulator. Um, so it would keep you warm in the winter, keep you cool in the summer. Um, so that's an example of a sod house. So the other thing that was happening were these big wagon trains, right? And these wagon trains we can date back to the 1830s when people were coming out west um, and typically in the summer months, right? Because that's when you could uh, travel. Um, and these wagon trains could be anywhere from, you know, 100 people or even 50 people to up to 500 people. Um, they were very slow, very slow. You could only travel, you know, you had to you had to fix axles on a regular basis. You could you typically only travel about 10 miles a day. Um, so it took a very long time to travel in these big wagon trains. But, um, you know, the idea was, was that there was, you know, protection by traveling in big groups, that you could take care of each other. It was a lot safer than just kind of going out on your own. So there were several wagon trails that already existed even before the, you know, onset of the Homestead Act. The Bozeman Trail was one of them that went through the, the Dakota territories. Um, the Oregon Trail, of course, is a very famous um, one that goes, of course, out to Oregon. Um, and then the Mormon Trail, which traveled from uh, Illinois out to Salt Lake City. Um, and then the Santa Fe Trail, which was actually an old Spanish trail that traveled the southern route um, and uh, was, uh, went through, you know, um, New Mexico, Arizona, um, into the lower part of California, into Southern California.
So the other thing that's happening um, in the West at this time that is bringing people out West is the mining opportunities, right? We have, of course, the California Gold Rush, which takes place in 1849, which uh, brings tons of people um, from all over the world um, to California. And that was true for all of the mining places in the mining towns. They tended to be very international um, you had people coming up from South America, from Mexico, um, from Australia, from Asia. Uh, you had people coming from Hawaii. Um, so people came from all over, Europeans, all over the world um, to converge on the West for these mining opportunities. And really, by the time we get to about 1860, all of the surface gold um, in the West was gone. Um, and so they had to find different ways to extract the gold, right? So you have hard rock mining, you have hydraulic mining, um, but you have these big mining operations. And basically those uh, the, that um, minerals would be extracted through these big companies, these big mining companies. So people then after the that you know, all the surface gold was gone, uh, became, you know, went to go work for these mining companies. So these big towns would spring up around these mines. And the one that you see pictured here is Virginia City, Nevada, which was um, home to a lot of people. It was a big city for its time. Um, and it was very close to the Comstock mine, which was this huge silver deposit that was found uh, in Nevada um, in 1859. So lots of different types of mining, um, silver, gold, and copper were the most common. Um, as I mentioned, the mining towns are very diverse, right? So on any given day, you could walk through a mining town in the West and you would hear all of these different types of languages being spoken. You might smell different types of food being cooked. Um, so it was a very interesting place. And that's one of the things that I I'd like to emphasize about the West is that it was a diverse place. From the very beginning, the West was very diverse um, and has always been, has remained that way to today. Uh, if you worked in a mine, it was very hard work. Um, it was, it could be very dangerous. There could be noxious gases that could kill you. There could be a, of course, a shaft collapse where you would basically get stuck under a bunch of rubble. rubble. Um, you, if you spent lots of time down in the mines, you could get certain types of lung disease. So there was all, there was a lot of problems um, that miners faced. And so because of that mining, um, Mine workers will actually be some of the first to unionize in the United States, and they will. Um, that will happen as we get to the latter part of the 19th century. But um, we're going to talk about unions in this class and labor movements and the importance that they have on American history uh, moving forward. But yeah, so mining opportunities that was a huge draw for people coming out west. So the other thing, um, and this is a map that shows us, so if you look on this map, you'll notice the little pickaxes. Those are the areas where there was a big gold rush, right? So um, you'll notice that, of course, Ca California, Nevada, but there's also one in Colorado. Um, you also see a lot of different uh, mining operations in Idaho and Montana. So lots of um, areas were engaged in mining. Um, the other thing that's happening is the ranching industry. Um, and this is kind of a carryover from the Mexican period of uh, this region's history. You know, you have the Caballeros, but you also have, you know, a lot of the Californios out in California that had been ranching for, you know, decades. And so you've got um, people coming out to work on these ranches and you've got cowboys um, that are going to work for these massive cattle drives. And you'll notice here on the map, these uh, lines that are going from Texas up to the train lines. Um, so the train lines terminated at places like Aberdeen and Dodge City in Kansas, and then Cheyenne, Wyoming. And so these big cattle drives, the, the cowboys would go up, round out the cattle, and drive them up to these train terminuses where they would get put on, the live cattle would get put on trains and then shipped out east to the 
big population centers so that people, you know, to the butcher houses so that people could eat them. So again, this was a huge draw for a lot of people um, to come out and either own a ranch or work on a ranch. So as I mentioned before, um, there is a huge amount of diversity in the West and, you know, the stereotype of the John Wayne cowboy and all of that really gets blown away when you look at the reality. Um, the reality is, is that an estimated one quarter of the cowboys working in the Texas ranching industry were African American. Um, there were also a lot of Mexican cowboys, Native American cowboys, right? So we've got a, a big, diverse population out, out west. Okay, so now we're going to turn our attention to talking about Native Americans on the frontier. And before we begin, we need to talk about uh, federal policy towards Native people. So throughout U.S. history, federal policy towards Native Americans has changed over time. Um, when the country was first founded, there was a federal policy of essentially treating Native American tribes like autonomous nations and going out and making treaties with them and trying to negotiate land sales and all of that. But that was um, not very successful for a number of reasons. Um, but And so right around 1830s with the presidency of Andrew Jackson, um, they started to, instead of going out and negotiating, there was this move to basically remove Native people who were looked at as being in the way of progress. And the most famous example of that is the Indian Removal Act. Um, which will eventually lead to the Trail of Tears, which is the image that you see here on this slide. Um, and then, you know, eventually that wasn't going to work either. And the reason for that is because you can't just keep removing Native people. Um, you need needed a different solution. And the government literally called it the Indian problem. So instead of removing Indians and trying to push them further west, which now would not be practical, the government decided to switch to a policy of containment. And this, of course, is the reservation system. So as we get into the latter half of the 19th century, the federal government is going to move forward with this policy of containment. And it is not a choice for the Native people, it is absolutely mandatory. This actually sets off an entire period of American history where the federal government and the United States military is at war with Native American tribes. This is a time period generally known as the Indian Wars. So if we were to put a time frame on this, it would be 1865 with the end of the American Civil War all the way until 1890 with the massacre at Wounded Knee. So we're gonna talk about that. I'm gonna give some examples. Um, the examples that I'm giving, I'm, I'm focusing on one tribe in particular, the Lakota, also sometimes called the Sioux tribe. Um, they're the same, same tribe. Uh, Sioux is the, the French name for the Lakota people. Um, and they're a really good example of, you know, Native American resistance to this reservation system and ultimately what happens as a result of that resistance. So let's look at a map now. Um, and this map really tells us a lot about Native people over time. So if we look at this, this is a map of the United States, and on the right-hand side, you have all of these eastern areas, and you can see that um, before 1850, all of these Indian lands had been ceded. Now, the word ceded just basically means given up, right? Either in, to the federal government or to private um, landowners, et cetera. So you can see by 1850, that is very significant piece, pieces of land there that have been basically um, taken or um, given up um, 
from, by, to, from the native people. But then if we look at the yellow parts of this map from 1850 to 1870, that area, those areas are also being ceded. Again, sometimes through force, sometimes through treaty agreements, sometimes through buying. I mean, there's lots of different ways that this can happen. Um, and then from 1870 to 1890, you can see further shrinkage of Native American land in the brown there. And then finally, um, the reservations in 1890. And you see how much land has shrunk significantly. You'll also notice on the map these little explosions. Um, those are areas that indicate where there were battles um, between the United States military and Native people. Now, this is not a complete map, so there were a lot more battles than the ones that you actually see on the map. But these are the big ones, right? These are the ones that you kind of went down in history. And we're going to be talking about a couple of them up here in South Dakota, um, the Wounded Knee Massacre, and also um, up here in Montana, the Battle of Little Bighorn. So one of the things that was really destructive for Native people um, and during this time period of westward expansion was the massive destruction of the buffalo herds. So there was once as many as 30 million bison, also called the buffalo, um, that roamed the plains of the United States at one point. And as people started to move westward, the buffalo herds started to diminish. Now, there are several reasons why this took place. Number one, there was massive sport hunting. So people just going out and hunting for sport. Um, sometimes this was done maliciously. Sometimes it was done because of boredom. Uh, sometimes it was done because of uh, practical reasons. For example, when the uh, Transcontinental Railroad was being built, um, the railroad workers would oftentimes just kill the buffalo to move them out of the way. Okay, so, so hunting for sport, number one reason. Number two reason is hunting for money, right? So buffalo, the, the hides of the buffalo, they were valuable as souvenirs. A lot of people on the East Coast liked them. Europeans liked them, liked to buy them. Um, also hunting to sell the, the actual hides to use as leather for various goods. And one of the biggest uses of buffalo hide would be in the big um, industrial belts that drove big like steam engines and things like that. So we've got hunting for sport, hunting for, for, uh, for money, for profit. Um, then the, sec the third thing we've got is a disease. Um, that takes place during this time period. So we know that there were some diseases that swept through the buffalo herds. That was not uncommon. That alone could not kill as many buffalo as were killed in a very short period of time. And then the final reason, number four, is that there were uh, real problems with drought in the la latter half of the 19th century. And so it was like this horrific perfect storm for these buffalo herds. And in a very short period of time, um, the buffalo will go to near extinction. In fact, it gets the herd gets so small that many people thought that the buffalo were extinct, but it turns out that there were about 300 left. Um, and they were able to eventually conservationists in the 20th century will be able to uh, protect that herd and now that herd um, is obviously a protected species and has grown but not nearly to the numbers that it once was. Now why is the destruction of the buffalo important? I mean besides the fact that it's a major you know environmental catastrophe. The destruction of the buffalo is important because the native people particularly the northern plains tribes relied upon the buffalo for everything, everything, their shelter, their clothing, their food, medicine, their tools, literally everything uh, that had to do with their way of life relied upon the buffalo. 
So this destruction of the buffalo is going to weigh particularly hard on these Plains Indians, and um, it will just add really to their misery. The image that you're seeing here is um, a, a pile of buffalo skulls, um, and these uh, people have gathered these buffalo skulls in order to grind them down to make a fertilizer for crops. Um, so, but it's a very striking image because it shows you how many dead buffalo there were. Um, and it's kind of like a snapshot of this, you know, horrific event, um, environmental um, event in human history, in U.S. history specifically. Okay, so as I mentioned, I'm really going to focus on one tribe um, in this lecture, but this is kind of indicative of what a lot of tribes were going through at the time. So I'm going to talk specifically about the Lakota people. So the Lakota people, um, they're Northern Plains tribe. Um, they kind of have that iconic Native American look. They're the ones with the big feather um, headdresses, right? They live in teepees. Um, and so they were, according to the government, in the way, okay? Um, they were right along the Bozeman Trail, which was um, a major um, traffic way for settlers coming out west. And so because there was occasionally conflicts between the settlers and the Lakota people, um, the government decided to reach out to the Lakota and create a treaty with them. And this happens in 1868. And this is called the Treaty of Fort Laramie. And the Treaty of Fort Laramie of 1868 basically did one major thing. It guaranteed the Lakota people ownership and hunting rights of the Black Hills. Okay. Now the Black Hills of um, South Dakota were sacred areas for the Lakota, or for, are still to this day, sacred land for the Lakota people. They had a lot of myth, mythologies and things surrounding it. A lot of their creation stories were centered there in the Black Hills. And so it was very important to them that they maintain um, their uh, territorial, you know, rights in this region. Unfortunately, just several years after this treaty was made in 1868, in 1874 to be exact, um, there was gold discovered in the Black Hills. And this basically prompted the government to completely disregard the Treaty of Fort Laramie. And um, this was a huge blow to the Lakota people that, you know, the government had you know, made this treaty with them, had made these promises to them, um, and then just completely ignored it and acted as if it didn't even exist. Um, in 1877, the United States government officially seizes the land that was once held by the Lakota and was sacred to the Lakota. Um, one of the, th just a side note, um, the one of the most famous monuments um, in, in America is now lo located um, in the Black Hills, and that's Mount Rushmore, um, with the, you know, big heads of the presidents, you know, um, up there. So you can imagine, um, again, what an insult and what a blow that really is to the Lakota people to have that representation there on their sacred land. Okay, so the Lakota are angry, um, to say the least, and um, we're going to talk now, we're going to shift to talk about um, these two men. Um, on the left-hand side is Sitting Bull, uh, and he is a Lakota, and he is a Lakota medicine man, and he decides that he wants to lead his people away from the reservation. Because once the gold was discovered in the Black Hills, uh, the Lakota people were then 
being forced onto reservations. So he decides that he is going to lead this big group of Lakota along with some other native tribes, local tribes like the Cheyenne and the Arapaho, and they are going to create this big wandering tribal group and they are going to basically try to stay away from the reservation. The person who you see on the right is Colonel George Custer, Colonel Armstrong, George Armstrong Custer. And he is tasked with, along with a couple of other uh, officers, um, army officers, with tracking down Sitting Bull in this roving group of Native people who are trying to, uh, uh, you know, prevent themselves from being put onto the reservation. Now, Colonel Custer was somebody who had fought in the American Civil War, and he had wanted to, basically, um, after the Civil War, remain um, an officer and go out into the West to fight Indians. Um, he considered himself quite the Indian fighter, and he always thought that he could outsmart Indians in any circumstance. Um, and so he very enthusiastically um, joins this group of soldiers who are setting out in pursuit of Sitting Bull and his people. And eventually, Custer and Benteen and Reno, his fellow officers, are going to uh, catch up with this massive roving band of uh, Native people. And this will culminate in a battle. And this is known as the Battle of Little Bighorn, sometimes also referred to as Custer's Last Stand. It takes place in 1876 over the course of two days, June 25th to June 26th. Basically what happens is once um, Custer and the rest of the soldiers catch up to this massive group of Native people, they are unaware of how large this group is. It's estimated that this roving um, Indian encampment was anywhere between three to 5,000 Indians. Um, and again, they're they're gathering together to basically escape the reservations, to avoid being put on the reservations. And so Custer and Benteen and Reno, they're all tasked with going, rounding up these Native people and bringing them back to the reservation. Now, Custer, when when they get there and they, they see that, they, you know, that they have caught up with the Indian encampment, um, Custer decides that he is going to break off on his own with his seventh cavalry. And um, he, you know, makes all kinds of really sort of rash decisions by not, he doesn't take a Gatlin gun with him. Um, he refuses to have any kind of backup with him, with his men. Um, he also makes a decision to split up his cavalry um, and that will weaken his forces as well. Um, but basically, um, he splits off. He thinks he's going to go attack this Indian encampment on his own. And he ends up getting trapped by a group of Native American warriors. And his entire 7th Cavalry and Colonel Custer are killed in this um, battle. And it's, it's about 247 uh, men altogether are lying dead. Now, Benteen and Reno have no idea that this has happened, so they continue fighting with the Indians. And on to the next day, on the 26th, um, Custer is killed on the 25th. And so on the 26th, uh, Benteen and Reno, after they've engaged in some skirmish, skirmishes with the uh, Indians, they set off to go try to find Custer, and they find just this massive, um, you know, um, pile of dead soldiers. And um, the reason why the Battle of Little Bighorn is important is, well, there are two major reasons. Uh, the first is that this is a, an Indian, a rare Native American victory, right? So the Native Americans are able to uh, be victorious in this battle. Uh, Benteen and Reno are, are basically retreat. Um, Custer's body is, 
is you know brought back to um, the fort nearby. Um, but then, so that's the first reason why it's important. But the second reason is that the the way that the army reacts to this is at, with a massive backlash against the native people. Um, the treatment of the native people after 1876 in the Battle of Little Bighorn is going to be horrific. Um, they are going to sometimes go out and just slaughter whole villages if they're not cooperating or if they're not going on to reservations. So um, the battle itself is very um, symbolic of Native American resistance. Even to this day, it is seen as one of the greatest battles in Native American history because of the fact that they were able to beat back this force of soldiers and the leader, um, Colonel Custer, who they knew he had a reputation amongst Native people. And so they knew who he was and they felt, you know, very proud of the fact that they had actually killed him because he was a known Indian fighter, killer and raper of Indian women. And so, um, so this was a major victory for the native people. But as I said, it will create this huge backlash moving forward. So you can click onto this YouTube link and you can watch a little um, just summary of the Battle of Little Bighorn. And you will also see in that video um, place where the actual battle took place as it looks today. A artist depiction of the Battle of Little Bighorn and Custer's Last Stand. So he was known amongst the native um, people. They they called him uh, yellow hair, or sometimes they called him long hair. Um, and as I mentioned, he had a really bad reputation. Um, so they were they were very happy to to kill him. Um, but also, uh, Sitting Bull had had a vision um, that Custer was going to be killed um, before the the troops even arrived. He had a vision that this would happen, and so. Um, that, I think, also added to the confidence of the Native people in this battle. So news of the Battle of Little Bighorn and other conflicts that were happening on the frontier were, were getting back to Washington and getting back to the East Coast, where a lot of people were very disturbed by the violence that was taking place as a result of these Indian wars. So in 1869, President Ulysses S. Grant um, and a group of Eastern reformers who, you know, really probably were very well-meaning, um, decided to come up with this new peace policy towards the Native people. Um, and this peace policy was aimed at basically converting Native people into um, American civilization, to integrating them into American civilization, um, and ultimately giving them citizenship, right? Um, remember that Native people are exempt from citizenship under the 14th Amendment at this time. So the these Eastern reformers and the president, they start to think of, well, how can we do this, right? How can we implement this? So they create the Board of Indian Commissioners in 1871, and this is kind of the predecessor of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the BIA. And basically what it was was a federal agency that would oversee this transition from just trying to isolate Native people onto reservations to trying to figure out ways to integrate them into American society. So basically they're becoming wards of the nation instead of being recognized as independent nations. So there were several, a uh, couple of ways that um, the government went about trying to implement these policies. And so that's what I'm going to talk about now. The first is the Indian boarding schools. Um, this was a way to try to basically Americanize Native American children. Um, and it was not optional. It was required. 
So if you were a family living on a reservation and you had a young child, your child was required to attend these boarding schools. Now the boarding schools were oftentimes on the, or near the reservation or on the outskirts of the reservation. Sometimes they might be miles and miles away from the reservation. It just depended. But basically these boarding schools were places that the Indian children would go and they would be taught how to you know, read and write and do math, but they would also be required to speak English. They would not be allowed to practice any of their traditional religious activities. They were expected to cut their hair, um, to dress in American clothing, et cetera. So it was a total stripping, basically, of any kind of cultural tra traditions of Native people. Um, and the way that the curriculum of these boarding schools was structured was that basically you were training the children to um, be in uh, low level paying uh, jobs. So for example, the, the boys were taught how to farm or how to chop wood or um, mechanics or those types of um, jobs. And then the girls were taught like domestic skills so that maybe they could go and be maids and that type of thing. So we're not talking about, you know, providing children with, you know, high level education, you know, so that they could go and be the next, you know, doctors and lawyers and things like that. It was a very sort of limited um, curriculum that was offered to these children. And the, the really the ultimate goal of these boarding schools was to basically strip these Native American children of their culture. Now there was resistance to this, as you can imagine, there would be, um, especially by the parents. Um, so there are instances of parents trying to hide their children. Um, uh, parents maybe sending their children off to uh, na uh, you know, fa another family member to try to hide them. You know, So there are all these um, stories about that. Um, but many, many Native American children went through these boarding schools and, you know, there was, uh, it, there was mixed response, but in general, the, those places oftentimes had um, instances of abuse, um, you know, both physically and sexually. So it was, it was a very, it could be a very horrific experience. I mean, not to mention just the fact that you're away from your family. So I have this link here, this YouTube video, and it talks in greater detail about Indian boarding schools. Um, and so go ahead and click on that and take a look at that. Right, so here now we're looking at some images of these um, boarding schools and you can see, so the images over here on the left-hand side, you'll notice this is kind of like a before and after. This was the kind of thing that the um, boarding schools would show to like their benefactors, right? So let's say, you know, you're on the East Coast and you're sending money to this boarding school, you know, um, donating money to this boarding school. And so they would say, look what a success it is. You know, look at the girls when they first come in, they're, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're looking very sort of Native American and look at them now, you know, sitting at the checkerboard and, you know, in, you know, proper clothing and that kind of thing. And so those are the types of um, like sort of propaganda that would um, be, you know, talked about. Um, this was a famous quote from one of these, you know, reformers who, who really believed in this kind of stuff to civilize the Indian, get him into civilization, to keep him civilized, let him stay. Um, so this was sort of the, the underlying, uh, dri the driving force, philosophical driving force behind this. Um, so here's some images of the girls and then um, now switching to some images of the boys. Um, so, and again, these um, uh, boarding schools lasted well into the 20th century. Um, and you can see some of the dates on here. Um, this uh, 1911 for the Car Carlisle Indians uh, football team up there. So that was a way to acculturate the children, but um, the government wanted to come up with a different way to acculturate the 
uh, adults. And so the, the way that that was gone about is through uh, land allotment. And so there was a, a, a land allotment act called the Dawes Allotment Act. It was passed in 1887. And basically there's two motivating factors here, right? One was that um, the government wanted more land and that settlers wanted more land. Um, so there, there was, this was a mechanism for settlers to get more land. And I'll explain how that worked in a minute. Um, but the other motivator, of course, is to get the uh, people on the reservation to sever their ties with their tribe. Um, so this was a way to basically turn Native American adults into private land-owning citizens of the United States. So, okay, what did this do? Basically, what it did is it took reservation land, the government took reservation land, um, and then divided it up into parcels. So there would be 160 acre parcels or 320 acre parcels. And basically, if you were Native American living on that reservation and you were the head of the family, you would be given the opportunity to claim either 160 acres of farmland or 320 acres of grazing land if you wanted to ranch. Now, if you took this deal, you would become a citizen of the United States. But in order for that to happen, that meant that you would sever all of your ties with your tribe. So basically you would no longer be part of the tribe. You would no longer get any kind of um, annuities or any of the things um, because the government would oftentimes subsidize tribes um, helping them through hard times with, you know, food and things like that, you wouldn't be able to get any of that. You would now be a private landowning citizen. You would have to figure out a way to pay taxes on that land. Um, and then the other catch was, well, if you don't do it, then we're going to take the land anyway, and then we're going to give it out to the Anglo settlers, right? The American settlers that are coming through. Um, so a lot of Native Amer Americans did not take this deal because they recognized it for what it was, which was basically, um, it, it was basically the government trying to manipulate them into uh, becoming these private landowning citizens and then basically having to be on their own moving forward. Um, and that, that would cause a lot of problems because, of course, now the a lot of the members of the tribes have become very dependent um, on the government and that happened for a number of reasons um, so anyway so so back to the dawes allotment act so what ends up happening is because the a lot of people did not take the a lot land allotments the dawes act will reduce the indian land by about a hundred million acres so the the land and the the amount of reservation land that a lot of these native people have will shrink down even further so here we see um, an image of a poster right um, ad to sell indian land um, you know fine lands in the West, et cetera, et cetera. So the Dawes Act lasts for quite some time. It lasts into the 20th century. They're still selling off um, Indian land. So I think I mentioned this earlier when I mentioned the 14th Amendment, but um, with the exception of some people, um, uh, Native Americans could not become citizens of the United States until 1924. So as you can see, um, by 1900, there was about 53,000 Native people who will become citizens under the Dawes Act. Um, but Congress will not collectively uh, recognize Indian citizenship until 1924. And this will be passed as the Indian Citizenship Act. And you can see the image here. These are members of the Osage tribe. Um, and in the middle there is President Calvin Coolidge. <laughs>
So despite the fact that times were hard for Native people during the Indian Wars and beyond, um, there was always acts of resistance, right? Acts of resistance. And one of the largest, biggest acts of resistance was the ghost dance. Now, the ghost dance was a type of revival religion um, that comes around during the times of the Indian Wars. It was actually started by a Paiute medicine man by the name of Wavoka. And Wavoka had this vision that if the tribes came together and performed this dance, that they would be able to turn away all of the white settlers, that the buffalo would return to the plains, that their ancestors that had been killed in the Indian Wars would return, right? And um, it was a very spiritual dance, um, and it was it was a new phenomenon in indirect response to uh, the Indian Wars. So um, over time, this ghost dance actually travels all throughout the West um, to various tribal groups. And by the time we get to the late 1880s, it has reached uh, the Lakota people and it has reached the reservations, Pine Ridge Reservation and the, the areas um, where the Lakota people were had been rounded up to. And the government starts to be very um, suspicious of the ghost dancers. Um, they start to believe that the ghost dancers the ghost dancers had started this this saying that when they danced the ghost dance that they were immune from bullets. Um, and the government didn't like that. And so in 1889, um, the government outlaws the ghost dance and basically says you can no longer perform this dance. And that will lead to a major conflict, a massacre, really. That's what we're going to talk about next. The massacre at Wounded Knee. This takes place in 1890. So Wounded Knee is one of these really, really sad events in American history. Basically what happens is a group of soldiers is ordered to pursue some Lakota ghost dancers. Um, and they eventually catch up to them on the outskirts of the Pine Ridge Reservation, South Dakota. And they, the, the Indians who were mostly women and children and older people um, had made an encampment and the soldiers decided to surround the encampment. Um, they wanted to disarm the Indians because some of them had guns and they wanted to prevent them from performing the ghost dance. Um, and so they, they kind of create this circle around their encampment, an armed circle. Right. And um, the following day, and so they, they make camp for the night, they go to bed. The following day, uh, one of the uh, soldiers um, goes down into the, the village, the, the encampment, and says, um, you need to give us all your guns. And when that happens, there's some kind of a skirmish takes place. And, and the story goes that there was a deaf man who they tried to disarm and he didn't know what was going on. And so there was a struggle. He doesn't give up his arms and um, there was a struggle and basically the gun went off. So um, there's a massive panic and all of the soldiers um, that were, you know, stationed around the encampment just start firing um, on the native people in there. And when it was all said and done, um, 25 soldiers will be dead, but somewhere around 150 to 300 Lakota are all shot and killed, some of them children. Um, and the reason why Wounded Knee is an important event in Native American history is really several reasons. Um, the first is it represents the end of the Indian Wars. Um, Wounded Knee and the massacre at Wounded Knee 
also represents the end of the ghost dance um, and sort of that final acts of resistance that Native people were trying to carry out um, during uh, the Indian Wars. Um, and after this, moving forward, um, the relationships between Native American people and the federal government will remain very strained um, and very tense, um, but Native people will feel a sense of defeat. Um, this is also the same year in 1890 that Geronimo was taken as a prisoner of war of the United States government. So it really is sort of this last, you know, stand for resistance. And then when this horrific massacre takes place, um, basically you're, you, um, you're no longer going to get that large scale organized uh, resistance by Native American people. So there's a YouTube link here. You can log in onto this and watch um, the story of Wounded Knee. I recommend you do that for sure. Um, and let me know if you have any questions.